In this video, I'm going to cover solutions and solubility. The major component of a solution is called the solvent, and the minority component is called the solute. A solution is a homogeneous mixture of two or more components. So solutions form in part because of intermolecular forces. So particles of the solute and particles of the solvent can interact with each other if they have similar intermolecular forces. When a valve separating different gases is opened, the gases can spontaneously mix by diffusion. So when this valve is open, the argon and the helium, the helium moves over to this side and the argon moves over to this side, and after time, equilibrium is established, and I have um, a approximately equivalent number of particles on each side of the flask. Well, solutions do the same thing. When solutions with different solute concentrations come into contact, they also spontaneously mix to result in a uniform distribution of solute. So if I had just water on one side and a solution with water and salt on the other side, and I open the valve, they are also going to mix so that over time, the particles of salt would be evenly distributed throughout both sides of the container. There are lots of different types of solutions. So um, we generally think of a solution as being a liquid, something that's dissolved in water, for example. Well, there are um, lots of different kinds of liquid solutions, like a gas that's dissolved in liquid is a soda. Uh, liquid dissolved in liquid, an example of that might be alcohol. Um, ethanol is the component of beer or vodka or wine that would make you drunk. And a solid dissolved in a liquid is an example of like salt in water or, or sugar in water. Um, is another example that we would think of as a solution. But there are also other, um, we can, the solvent phase doesn't have to be a liquid. The solvent phase could be a gas. So a gas that's dissolved in other gases could be considered, um, an example of that could be considered air. So air is composed of about 75% uh, nitrogen and about 22% oxygen. So in that case, we would consider nitrogen to be the solvent um, as a gas because it's the majority phase, there's 75%, and the minority phase would be oxygen at 22% in that case. Um, so air is considered an example of a solution. Seawater is considered an example of a solution. Um, so many of the things that we come into contact with every day are solutions. Um, we can also have a kind of solution where the solvent is a solid and the solute is a solid. For example, if we heat two metals up until they're both molten and we mix them together, um, then as they harden, as their particles are free to distribute or free to move around, um, they will be, the particles will be evenly distributed when it cools down and solidifies and we create what's called an alloy, which is when I mix two metals together. Um, brass is an example of that. So um, in an example, in soda, for example, we would see that the solvent is water, H2O, because there are more H2O particles than CO2 particles. And the CO2 particles are dissolved in the water, which means that they're equally distributed throughout the water. And they um, are interacting through intermolecular forces with the H2O molecules. So the driving force behind whether or not a compound is going to dissolve is um, whether or not those two compounds have the same or similar enough intermolecular forces. And remember, intermolecular forces come from the polarity of a molecule. So when there's a difference in electronegativity between two atoms, like a tug of war um, for the electrons. So um, molecules that are have similar polarity are um, can mix well together and so molecules that are very nonpolar they uh, can form a solution they mix well because this particle of pentane can interact with this particle of heptane through dispersion forces and the, this particle of pentane doesn't necessarily know that this is not another particle of pentane because their forces are so similar they interact with each other as if they were the same molecule so heptane and pentane mix very well um, acetone and chloroform would mix very well. Acetone has a dipole-dipole force because of the carbon-oxygen bond is a polar bond. Chloroform has three carbon-chlorine bonds and they're all polar, so that gives an overall dipole moment that points right between those three chlorines. 
So these two particles can interact because they have similar intermolecular forces, dipole-dipole forces. The dipole of this acetone molecule can interact with the dipole of this chloroform molecule. They're similar enough. So acetone and chloroform would mix well together. But acetone does not mix particularly well with nonpolar solvents because this has a dipole-dipole intermolecular force. It's looking for other dipoles to align with. And nonpolar substances don't have dipoles to align with. They only experience dispersion forces. When we get to hydrogen bonding, um, this ethanol particle has an OH bond, and that's one of those special bonds for hydrogen bonding. Remember, OH, NH, or FH. And so this OH bond can participate in hydrogen bonding on ethanol. And water has two OH bonds, this OH bond and this OH bond. So water can um, hydrogen bond, and ethanol can hydrogen bond, so they can hydrogen bond with each other. This water particle doesn't necessarily know whether this is another particle of water or another particle of ethanol. They fit together pretty well. Now they don't fit together perfectly, so water is soluble in water to an unlimited extent. I can always add more water to water because it will they'll never separate. But ethanol, when I add ethanol to water, there comes a point at which I've added the maximum amount of ethanol to the water and I can't add um, I will, cannot increase the concentration of the solution anymore. So they don't fit together perfectly, but they fit together pretty well. Um, and finally, if we're talking about dissolving ionic compounds in water, like salt, like in seawater, sodium chloride dissolves in water because um, H2O molecules are very polar. They have a uh, hydrogen bonding which means that on this side of the water molecule is very negative with the oxygen and on this side of the water molecule is very positive with those hydrogens. So these dipole moments on water can interact with ions through the ion dipole force. And so water and I, um, ionic compounds and water mix pretty well. Water is so polar that it's almost, we could almost consider it ionic because those, um, the distribution of electrons between the oxygen and hydrogen um, is so skewed toward the oxygen. The oxygen takes most of those electrons. So pro, um, compounds that are similar in structure and similar in intermolecular force will mix together well. But compounds that are not similar in structure, like water for example, will not mix well with pentane or heptane because water is looking for other particles that can hydrogen bond. It wants to hydrogen bond with other particles. Water does not want to interact with particles that only experience a dispersion force. So when a solution forms, this is kind of, these are kind of the steps that have to occur. The solute, are stu they're stuck together. So if we're talking about sodium chloride, for example, or sugar um, in a solid, these atoms are as close together as they can pack, closest pack structure. And in order for that solute to mix with a solvent and create a solution, first those particles need to separate. So there are forces that are holding these solid particles together. Breaking those, part, but those forces apart requires some energy. We can say the same thing of the solvent. The solvent, the water molecules are stuck together as tightly as they can. They're really, really close to each other. There's no room for solute in there. In order to make a solution, those water molecules have to separate a little bit and make room for the solute particle. So this takes energy. This takes energy. When they mix, when the solvent and the solute mix together and make a solution, that releases energy. So um, whether or not this overall process, this dissolution process, is going to be endothermic or exothermic, whether it will absorb energy overall or release energy overall depends on the magnitude of the energy in each step. How much energy is required to separate the solute? How much energy is required to separate the solvent? And how much energy do I get back when I mix the separated solute and the separated solvent? So the general rule is that like dissolves like. When we see two compounds that have similar polarity, then they are um, much more likely to create a solution than those that have different polarity. So a chemical substance will dissolve in a solvent if it has a similar structure to that solvent. So if they have the same intermolecular forces, then they, those particles can interact through those intermolecular forces that are the same.
Polar molecules and ionic compounds will be more soluble in polar solvents, and nonpolar molecules will be more soluble in nonpolar solvents. So like dissolves like. Polar and polar like to mix, nonpolar and nonpolar like to mix, and polar and nonpolar do not mix. So which of the following compounds will be soluble in water? So what we have to look for here is whether or not these compounds have the same intermolecular force as water. Um, and water has hydrogen bonding capability, remember, um, it's very polar between the hydrogen and the oxygen. Okay, so here's um, a model of water. And in this model of water, I have um, the oxygen and the hydrogen atoms. Remember, the oxygen has two lone pairs and the oxygen atom has a partial negative charge because of that dipole and the hydrogen atoms are partial positive because of the, those polar bonds. So the hydrogen bonds in water, each water molecule is capable of making four hydrogen bonds. So um, one hydrogen bond is made between hydrogen and oxygen, another hydrogen bond is made between the other hydrogen and an oxygen, and two hydrogen bonds are made between the lone pairs of electrons. So one lone pair of electrons makes this bond, and one lone pair of electrons makes this bond. So there are four total hydrogen bonds for each water molecule. So the um, H's, these are called hydrogen bond donors. So when this bond, this right here, um, this end of the hydrogen bond is being donated to this water molecule, and this water molecule is accepting that hydrogen bond. So in each hydrogen bond interaction, I can um, identify a donor, which is the positive side, and an acceptor. And here a donor and an acceptor. And this one, these are the donor is on this side. It's the positive hydrogen that's the donor. Donor, and then this side is a donor. And these are the acceptors here. Acceptor, acceptor. So each water molecule can donate two hydrogen bonds, and each hydrogen molecule can accept two hydrogen bonds. Two donors and two acceptors on every water molecule. So what that means is that water can interact with particles that also have hydrogen bonds. Any particle that is capable of hydrogen bonding can interact with water. Um, particles that are very, very polar can interact with water and dissolve in water. And particles that uh, don't have hydrogen bonding but that do have oxygen or nitrogen or fluorine atoms can also interact with water because the oxygen of other atoms can serve as a hydrogen bond acceptor to the hydrogen bonds of water. So if water has these H's and it's trying to donate a hydrogen bond and the other particles in the solution are not water, they're something that has a dipole-dipole force, for example, but not hydrogen bonding, then sometimes these water molecules are still capable of forming hydrogen bonds with, water, with molecules that don't hydrogen bond themselves. I know that sounds kind of confusing, but we'll see an example here in just a minute. Okay, so let's draw these first and look at their um, Lewis structures so we can determine what the intermolecular force is. So CH2Cl2 looks like this. And I've got um, polar bonds between carbon and chlorine because um, the electronegativity difference. And so when I have those two polar bonds, then I have a molecular dipole that points this way. They do not cancel out. There's, there's not perfect symmetry of these dipole moments, so vector addition does not cancel them out. So I have a molecular dipole that points this way, right in between those two polar bonds. So this molecule experiences a dipole-dipole force. The difference in electronegativity between carbon at 2.5 and chlorine at 3.0, the difference is only 0 0.5. Right, carbon is pretty electronegative, 2.5. Chlorine is more electronegative, 3.0. But this is a barely 
barely meets that threshold, exceeds that threshold of polarity. So remember, anything that's 0 to 0 0.4 is nonpolar. Anything that's 0.5 to 1.9 is polar. And anything that's 1.9 and above is uh, ionic. So 0 to 0 0.4 is nonpolar. So this being at 0 0.5 is almost nonpolar. So is this going to interact well with water? It is polar, but it's not very polar. So this is not going to interact with water. It does not dissolve in water. What about HCl? Well, let's look at the H. Cl is also polar. So this molecule is very similar. Um, the electronegativity difference is bigger here. I have H and Cl. H is 2.1, Cl is 3.0, so the electronegativity difference here is 0. 0 0.9 electronegativity difference between these atoms. So this dipole moment is bigger than, than this dipole moment. This still has a dipole-dipole force. So is this molecule soluble in water? Well, we would look at these two examples and say, well, it's more polar than this one, but it's still just dipole-dipole. It doesn't have hydrogen bonds, so we'd be thinking this one is not soluble in water. However, what kind of molecule is HCl? HCl is a special kind of molecule that we call an acid. Remember? And we know that it's an acid because acids always have H up front. So this is an acid. Do acids dissolve in water? Yes, because water can take that H. Water is a base. HCl is an acid, so they interact and make a solution. So when I look at some compounds, um, this is an important way to approach whether or not a compound is going to be soluble. But I also have to look at other factors, like for example in this one, this being an acid, I know that acids are soluble in water. So HCl dissolves in water. So this one, yes. Um, LiOH. LiOH. Remember that lithium is a metal, and what kind of compound has a metal in the front? An ionic compound has a metal in the front. So this lithium is actually an ion, Li plus, and this O is actually a minus, OH minus. So this compound, what kind of intermolecular force does this compound have? Ionic bond. So the water can interact with the plus and the minus with ion dipole intermolecular forces. We saw that before. Water interacts with ions. That's why ionic substances are generally soluble in water. And this compound also has an OH. So this part right here, this part of the molecule, the hydroxide ion, can hydrogen bond. So this molecule has an ionic bond, and it's capable of hydrogen bonding. So is this molecule soluble in water? Yes. Ionic compounds are mostly soluble in water. We learned some exceptions in chapter four. Uh, remember phosphates, carbonates uh, are generally not soluble. Um, but most ionic compounds are soluble in water. What about CO2? All right, so with CO2, change the color here. CO2 looks like this. All right, with two double bonds and oxygen out on the end. Are these polar bonds? Yes. Polar bonds toward oxygen, polar toward oxygen, 
Um, so in this case, I have these two polar bonds, and this is a linear geometry. They're separated by 180 degrees. So do you remember what happens in this case? These cancel. Remember, by vector addition, any time that two dipole moments are perfectly opposed to each other, symmetrically opposed, they cancel out. And so even though this compound has polar bonds, this compound is nonpolar. What kind of intermolecular force does a nonpolar compound have? Dispersion. Do compounds with nonpolar compounds with dispersion forces, do they mix well with water? No, because water is polar and like dissolves like. Polar things like polar things. This is nonpolar. So is CO2 soluble in water? It's not very soluble in water. We, um, you know what happens when you open a soda, all the bubbles come out. So yes, it's possible to get some carbon dioxide into the water, um, but generally inside of a soda, the way that we do that is by increasing the pressure. So we can make a gas more soluble in a liquid by increasing the pressure of that gas. So inside of a soda can, it's very high pressure. And when you open the soda can and release the pressure, what happens is all the bubbles come out of the solution. If you wait for very long, what happens to your open soda? It doesn't have any more bubbles in it, right? The, all of, it goes flat. All of the carbon dioxide leaves. So that tells us that carbon dioxide is not very soluble in water. It doesn't want to stick around. Does, in your soda, does all the sugar leave if you leave it open for a long time? No, the sugar stays in there because sugar is very soluble in water. So the sugar remains dissolved in an open soda. The CO2 does not. The CO2 leaves the soda as soon as the can is open. And that's because CO2 is nonpolar. It does not interact with the water molecules very well. And so the water, it's not sticky to the water molecules. It just floats away. So the trick here is finding when something is, um, this is almost nonpolar. It's, uh, low polarity. This one is nonpolar. This one is very polar. All right, so this one dissolves because it's pretty polar, 0.9 difference, and it's an acid. This one dissolves because it's very polar. It has ionic bonds and hydrogen bonding. This is nonpolar. It doesn't dissolve in water. This has very low polarity. It doesn't dissolve in water. What about CH2O? Well, remember, the first step is to draw the compound because we need to know how these atoms are actually arranged to know whether or not there's any polar bonds. So CH2O looks like this. Two lone pairs on the oxygen. So in um, this compound, does this have any polar bonds? Remember, C and H is not polar. It only has an electronegativity difference of 0.4. And C and O is polar. So there's one polar bond in this molecule, polarized this way towards the oxygen, away from the carbon. So this, this uh, molecule has a dipole-dipole force. It does not have hydrogen bonding, because even though it has hydrogen and oxygen, the hydrogen and the oxygen are not bonded together. So a CH bond cannot hydrogen bond. Only OH or NH or FH. So let's calculate the polarity difference here. Carbon is 2.5 electronegativity. Oxygen is 3.5 electronegativity. So this has an electronegativity difference of 1.0. So that's pretty polar. So we would look at this one. Whenever it's dipole-dipole, we have to ask ourselves, is this um, soluble in water? Dispersion compo compounds with only dispersion are not soluble in water. Compounds that have ionic bonds or hydrogen bonding are almost always soluble in water, with a few exceptions on the ions.
Compounds that have dipole-dipole, well, that's kind of 50-50. So it's easy when I've identified a nonpolar molecule, not soluble. It's easy when I've identified hydrogen bonding molecules, soluble. When it comes to dipole-dipole, I have to consider some other factors. Some particles with dipole-dipole like this are not soluble because it's too low polarity. There's not a big enough electronegativity difference. And some like this, <coughs> excuse me, they are soluble and it partially has to do with the electronegativity difference. But then you're saying, well, here's a CO bond and here's two CO bonds. So how come this CO2 is not, uh, does not dissolve but CH2O does. This, this is formaldehyde. Well, it's because there is no dipole moment on this side to cancel out. So this particle having that dipole moment without another opposing one to cancel out makes this particle polar. And another thing that this compound has going for it is that this oxygen atom, although although um, these two particles cannot hydrogen bond to each other, H2O, if I put another one here, H, C, H, O. There is no hydrogen bond between these two molecules. And if I try to draw the dots here and show that this would be a hydrogen bond, this is not happening. But if I put formaldehyde in with water, the only thing that I'm really changing there is making this now O. Right, so now formaldehyde is in a solution with water. Is it soluble with water? Well, actually, look at this interaction right here. This hydrogen bond can exist now that I'm talking about water because now this H is partial positive and this O is partial minus and this is an OH bond and this is an oxygen that can accept hydrogen bonds. So there is a hydrogen bond between formaldehyde and water. There is not a hydrogen bond, right, if we put this back and make this formaldehyde again. C O. The reason that this hydrogen bond does not exist anymore when it's between formaldehyde molecules is because this is no longer positive. Because the CH bond is not polar. No hydrogen bond between formaldehyde molecules. So because formaldehyde is capable of accepting a hydrogen bond from water, which is donating a hydrogen bond, then this one, that's another factor that makes this particle soluble in water. So yes, soluble. And now to NH3, what about NH3? Well, this one's easy. NH3 has what intermolecular force? Hydrogen bonding. Because the, the bonds that we look for in hydrogen bonding are NH, OH, or FH. And here's an NH bond. So does water, does ammonia, NH3, dissolve in water? And the answer is definitely yes, because we have these hydrogen bonds. In the same way that we just had a hydrogen bond between formaldehyde and water, we can have a, a hydrogen bond between ammonia and water and that makes these compounds soluble.